Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Nadine El Cassis. Uh, I'm uh, a gynecologic oncologist. Uh, I graduated as a medical doctor from St. Joseph University, Beirut, Lebanon, and then I did my residency in gynecology and obstetrics in St. Jo Joseph University, also in Beirut, Lebanon. I completed my fellowship in gynecologic oncology in Gustave Roussy Center in Paris, and then I returned and I'm working in Hotel Dieu de France, which is a university hospital in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, my major interest is gynecologic oncology and breast uh, uh, cancer surgery. So today I'll be sharing with you um, uh, some my uh, my small experience and uh, some knowledge about fertility preservation treatment in early endometrial cancer. So uh, I'll start with a small introduction about endometrial cancer. So endometrial cancer is one of the most uh, common gynecological cancers in the world, especially in developed country, countries. It occurs typically after the menopause, but in 20 to 25% of the patients, it occurs before menopause and to almost in almost 7% of the patient, it occurs between 20 and 44 years because of obesity, diabetes, and sedentarity. And the problem here is that uh, uh, most of uh, a great number of patients now uh, delay are delaying uh, their conception um, project, so their childbearing project. That's why it's a problem if they have endometrial cancer before having uh, children. Uh, so that's why uh, we, we, we suggest and we propose fertility preservation treatment in these patients. Uh, the good thing is in young women, um, endometrial cancer has usually a good prognosis because it occurs at an early stage. It is diagnosed at an early stage and it's highly differentiated at diagnosis. The standard treatment of endometrial cancer is a total abdominal hysterectomy with staging depending on risk factors. Uh, but in these patients, uh, we uh, suggest and propose conservative treatment, but it's a therapeutic challenge because there is a risk of disease progression as high as five to 6%. Here comes the role of the uh, gynecologic oncologist in both treating malignant disease and offering uh, fertility sparing alternatives when allowed. And uh, here comes the, the role of the uh, fertility uh, specialist, and we um, refer our patient, all our patients to a fertility specialist. Who are the candidates for this conservative treatment? So these are patients who have either uh, atypical hyperplasia or early endometrial cancer at stage 1A without myometrial invasion. So for patients who have endometrial cancer limited to the endometrium, and uh, the grade should be a grade one, and the histological type should be an endometrial cancer. So these are the conditions for conservative treatment. What are the treatment modalities? Uh, hormonal treatment with magistral acetate 160 to 320 milligrams per day or medroxyprogesterone acetate 400 to 600 milligrams per day or levonorgestrel IUD or combination of uh, different, different uh, molecules. And nowadays we use hysteroscopy uh, to diagnose, uh, to, uh, for the diagnosis of anemetric cancer and for the tumor resection followed by progesterone therapy. The response rate with these uh, treatments is very high, as 72 to 76% of, tumor, uh, of these tumors respond to progesterone treatment, and 20 to 41% recur after initial complete response. Uh, when we combine hysteroscopic resection and a progesterone treatment, we have higher response rates and low recurrence rate. 
And this is uh, one of the publications that we did regarding uh, this technique, where we showed in our series of 12 patients treated conservatively, uh, we, we had a very low recurrence rate of 10% and a high pregnancy rate, which is uh, something that we, uh, this is the aim of this treatment is to have a high pregnancy rate of 50, here we have 55%. And here another meta-analysis that show, uh, shows a high uh, response rates with hysteroscopy followed by progesterone uh, therapy. In 95%, we have a complete response and low recurrence rate of 14% with a high pregnancy rate of uh, 48%. And here we show also that with intrauterine progesterone therapy, which is the Levonorgestrel IOD, we have also a high uh, complete response rate and a low recurrence rate and a high pregnancy rate. So this is my answer for the first question. So um, the, we don't have a clear recommendation. This comes from uh, some uh, retrospective studies and some expert opinion. So this is, uh, till now it's unclear and there's no consensus. Some authors say it should be a minimum of three months with a median of nine months. Studies have showed that six months treatment with progesterone um, uh, Ha, uh, have a high complete response of 72% compared to 78% with a 12 months treatment. So usually what we are doing is giving uh, our patient six months. And if um, the follow-up with hysteroscopy and biopsy comes back negative after six months, we can uh, give the clearance for the patient to get pregnant. And if she doesn't want to get pregnant directly after the end of this six months treatment, so we, uh, con uh, we continue with uh, progesterone treatment with low doses or we shift to uh, uh, gonadotropin um, uh, GNRH agonist uh, to uh, suppress ovulation and lower the risk of recurrence, or sometimes uh, we give them aromatase inhibitor. So it's a minimum of six months. And after this six months, we allow them to get pregnant. And if they don't want or they don't have a partner to get pregnant, they should uh, stay under my maintenance treatment. And in some patients, obese and anovalic, uh, patients who has uh, who have anoval, uh, anovulation, they need longer treatments and follow-up. Thus, the, the duration of treatment should be individually tailored uh, depending uh, on the patient and her characteristics and the characteristics of uh, the tumor. So uh, here in conservative treatment, we work with patients who uh, have early endometrial cancer. So it's a stage 1A, not only stage 1A, it's limited to uh, the endometrium and they have a grade 1 tumors and they are endometriated. Usually in these patients, uh, the risk of lymph node metastasis is very low. Uh, it's uh, as I, I can show here, when uh, the tumor is limited to the endometrium, we have very low risk of having a, a pelvic or aortic uh, lymph node metastasis. And when we have grade one, the risk of having uh, lymph node metastasis is almost zero. But in general, the risk factors of having lymph node uh, metastasis is, uh, are the depth of invasion, so the myometrial invasion. When we have a grade 1B, we have a, great, a greater risk of having a lymph node metastasis. The grade, the grade of the tumor, a grade 2 and grade 3 have greater risk of having a lymph node metastasis. The tumor size, uh, the age of the patient, if she is uh, uh, aged more than 55 years, we are not talking about our patients who are here young because they want to have children. And we, uh, 
let's not forget the molecular classification endometrial cancer. For all, all our endometrial cancer patients, we look for pole mutation, um, um, MMR, and P53. So patients who are uh, mutated for P53, they are they are considered high risk patients and they have a high risk for having a lymphoma metastasis and we don't do for these patients conservative treatment uh, 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 also for patients who are mismatched repair deficient also we don't propose a conservative treatment because they have a very low response to progesterone treatment and they have high recurrence rate and patients who have lymph vascular space invasion on uh, the first biopsy uh, for endometrial cancer also have high risk of uh, lymphoma metastasis and how uh, what will help us to uh, have um, an idea of lymphoma metastasis uh, the, Im uh, the imaging with MRI contrast enhanced MRI combined to transvaginal ultrasound and in high grade and uh, high clinical stage of patients uh, of, with endometrial cancer stage uh, uh, with high myometrial uh, invasion, uh, we should do a PET scan, but not here in our patients. The, the risks are the uterine perforation, uh, which is uh, which uh, is the risk of uh, in every hysteroscopy, not only endometrial cancer hysteroscopy. It's less than one percent, and it's less if we use uh, ultrasound uh, uh, guided hysteroscopy. In all our patients, when we do hysteroscopy for any patient with hysteroscopy, we do our dilation guided by ultrasound. And also we do our resection uh, guided by ultrasound to uh, decrease the risk of perforation. And the other risk with hysteroscopic resection in these patients is to have anti-uterine adhesions. And um, this study demonstrates that in, that in 23 patients who had hysteroscopic resection and fertility sparing surgery for atypical hyperplasia and endometrial cancer, that uh, none of the 23 patients had uh, intrauterine adhesions. And why is this is very important in our patients? Because he, the aim of this conservative treatment is uh, to allow, allow them to have a pregnancy. So when we have adhesions, we have a high risk of infertility. But all the studies usually, uh, showed uh, safe, uh, that hysteroscopic resection is safe and the risk of intrauterine adhesions is almost the zero. And the, the risk also uh, in oncology, uh, some authors said that with hysteroscopy, you have a high risk of intraperitoneal neoplastic cells dissemination with the fluids you, that you use in hysteroscopy or with gas. But almost all the studies showed that even if we have uh, neoplastic cells intra peritoneal after the hysteroscopy, that doesn't mean that uh, we have a high recurrence uh, um, in, into the peritoneum, and that doesn't mean that we will that the patient will progress into a higher clinical stage. And there is no difference in median survival times after hysteroscopy compared with dilation and cure touch. So these are mainly the risks with hysteroscopy.